Hello, my name is Emma Bartha. I'm a journalist with Thomson Reuters Foundation, and I'm here for Newswatch at Women Deliver. We have five fantastic finalists with us today. They will be pitching their programs later today for a chance to win one of two 30,000 euro um, grants, and that is the Amplify Change pinch Pitching Competition. So I'm going to start with you, Choma. Um, I'd like you to explain a little bit about what Amplify Change is. Thank you, Emma. So Amplify Change is a multi-donor fund that was launched in 2014 and is managed by a consortium of Manion Daniels, African Women's Development Fund, and Global Fund for Women. Since they have been launched in 2014, they have carried out about 36 funding rounds. They have funded about 700 grants and disbursed about over 60 million euros. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yes. So, can you tell us why you want to win this grant? What's your um, project all about? Thank you. So, a project is titled Connecting the Dots, Advancing Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights to End Infantile Female Genital Mutilation or Cutting. This is a practice that is very prevalent in southeast part of Nigeria. And this grant is going to help us to save the life of thousands of female babies who undergo female genital mutilation or cutting within zero to 10 days of their birth. Mm. Oh, that sounds very worthwhile. I mean, female genital mutilation is something I write about a lot. So um, it's, a, it's a subject close to my heart. Um, are there laws in Nigeria for female genital mutilation and, and why is it continuing? Yes, there are laws in Nigeria that, are, that is banning the practice of female genital mutilation, but the challenge we're having is implementation of the law. Mm -hmm. So the community members are not aware that this law is even in existence or what to do if they're actually survivors of FGMC. So what, um, we, what we are doing is to carry out lots of campaigns. We're partnering with traditional rulers and religious leaders so community members can be aware of the consequences of the practice you know, and support them to take collective, uh, sub collective action for abandonment, as well as advocate at the national level for domestication or implementation of this policy that was and approved. just in case anyone's unaware, and there's been a lot of publicity about female genital mutilation um, in recent years, it's gained a lot more global attention, but what sort of impact does it have on girls and women in your country? So, the, there are different forms of FGM, but the one that is prevalent in the region where I work, which is the southeast part of Nigeria, is infantile female genital mutilation, which is a form of FGM that is practiced on female babies within zero to 10 days of birth. So a lot of survivors of this um, practice are not even aware that some of the health implications or the problems they have as they grow older, as young girls, as adults, is associated to a practice performed on them as infants. So one of the things which is why this project is so dear to us, is for we want to connect the dots for them so that they can understand that some of the health problems they're experiencing is as a result of a practice performed on them when they're infants. So they don't make the same mistake and um, perform infantile FGM on their daughters so we can break this destructive cycle that has continued for generations. And do you think it's possible to end FGM in a generation, as people say, if projects like yours get the funding that you're looking for? Yes, I believe so. Because we, different activists and NGOs are working from different angles. The, some are looking, some are targeting those at risk of infantile FGM. Some are targeting the grandmothers. And with this multi, multi integrated approach, I think we can end infantile FGM and FGM as a whole in one generation. Okay. Lovely, thank you. thank you. Now, coming to you, Habiba. Can you tell us about your project? Yeah, thank you. I'll be pitching about the Voices of Hope, a Fistula Survivors Movement. This is a project that is aimed at incorporating the voice of Fistula Survivors in the, in the global campaign to end Fistula. 
we hope that uh, when this, their voices are incorporated, they should be able to advocate for policies and availability of services that can not only prevent the occurrence of new fistulas, but also recurrence to those who are already treated. I think some people watching may not know what fistula is. Can you just explain briefly what it is and what impact it has on women in your country? Yes. Actually, obstetric fistula is a childbirth injury that is associated with prolonged obstruction of labor and is characterized by continuous leakage of urine or stool or both. Uh, the women who suffer from fistula are really ashamed. They lose their baby, they lose their relationship, they lose their friends, and they basically lose themselves. It's mm. very really tragic. Mm. And so what impact would your project have on turning that around? Yeah, we believe that this project will be able to advocate for availability of services that will be able to prevent the occurrence of the new cases. And when we, there are no new cases and also no, no new fistula occurring, we are going to have productive women in the community who are so ecologically well. Mm. And Flavia, can you tell us about your project, please? Yeah, our project is about harnessing the bottlenecks that are impeding the implementation of the National Sexuality Education Framework, which has been passed by the Ministry of Education in Uganda. We continue to see um, religious leaders challenging the implementation of this framework because they think sexuality education is about teaching young girls and boys on how to have sex. The real fact is young girls and boys are having sex. As we speak now, there is a, a young girl who is 13 who has delivered triplets. She was in primary six. Oh. And her mother is only 27. So wow. it shows that there is a cyclical kind of relationship. Mm. The mother had a child early. The daughter has a child early. So we are not going to get any development you know, effects or outcomes if we continue like this. And um, we would like to also ensure that we have a 360 degrees kind of approach to ensuring that everyone who is concerned, religious leaders, policy makers, um, the government, the media, sit on table and we go word by word of the sexuality framework, appreciate, define what sexuality is, tell them that it's not about having sexual intercourse but allowing girls to grow make choices, have information to make informed choices so that they are retained in school and they are able to be better citizens tomorrow. But above all, have kind of bodily autonomy over their lives. So if they were given the information at school, you believe then they wouldn't fall pregnant, so they'd be able to carry on at school, they'd be able to perhaps go to university or take up more jobs? Oh yes, if they were given information in time, mm. they would be able to know how to manage their sexual uh, growth, how they grow over time, what changes happen to them. So that when they are faced with challenges of sexuality, getting pregnant, where can they go to get family planning, uh, you know, available choices, where whom they can talk to, where they can get commodities, then definitely they will be retained more in school, live longer, delay sexual debut. If they are pregnant and want to not to have the child, they know where to go and get safe abortion in time, yes. Abortion has obviously been in the headlines and the news a lot. Is that a, yes. a problem in Uganda, is it? It's a big problem because of 47% um, of all maternal death is among the young girls 15 to 19. So it's a big, big problem and it's unsafe. Yet if we talked about it and we showed the girls where the services can be got, the safe services can be got, then we would prevent those deaths. Yes. And Edith. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Long way away. Can you um, tell me about your project? All right. Okay. So, um, uh, in the face or in the search of the recent Me Too movement, there has been some uh, mini version in Ghana um, where a lot of young women had come out to speak boldly about sexual harassment and sexual assault um, on some top 
people in Ghana. Unfortunately, um, what happens is that the, the the survivors rather become vilified, and then it you know everything is just swept under the carpet. And this has gone on for too long. It has happened in schools. It has, it has happened in communities. It has happened in different places, even at workplaces. So African Ghana um, has decided to use the opportunity to seek for this grant to be able to end the silence on SGBV um, and by ensuring that survivors themselves are in the middle of, you know, of the intervention so that it's not like people sitting somewhere and talk, you know, just writing down a number of things that they need to do, but survivors themselves sit on a round table and discuss what the proper possible interventions will be and also, most important is that we harness the personal stories of these survivors as powerful advocacy tools to call for change and, and end, end the silence on SGBV. So I, I stand with Chioma and the rest on the fact that our generation can actually end some of these things and our generation can actually end sexual assault and harassment. Yeah. So uh, how, how big a problem is it? In, uh, we hear a lot about it in Europe and, and the States, how big a problem is it in your country and, and surrounding countries, even the wider region? Right. So in, in Ghana, um, one in every three women is, is sexually harassed on a daily basis. And that's quite a serious figure. It's not a one in 10. It's not a one in 20. It's a one in three. Mm -hmm. um, even if it were a one in 10, it would have been a big problem. So that, that alone tells you um, how bad it is. And we have over 6% um, of girls and women who in school are warned or threatened by teachers that if you do not have sex with me, I am not going to give you your pass mark. So uh, I don't know about you, but I like I see beyond the figures and th these are like girls, like these are women's lives and I'm one of, you know, these figures. So uh, as soon as we can end this, it's, it's very important. And you mentioned that they face a lot of stigma when they speak out. Exactly. How do you go about tackling the stigma? Um, I can't say that we have fixed that. We are still going about tackling it. Um, the, the, the truth is that a lot of gender advocates in Ghana have been in such a strong safety net because the moment there's vilification, they come out strongly, especially using digital platforms. I think that has been like one of our greatest weapons over the years, using digital platforms to support our own. Um, so we want to move from just digital platforms and actually use community structures as safety nets so that, you know, if there's no Facebook in the community, if there's no internet in the community, the chief himself is like a strong figure who any girl can go to and report a sexual harassment case and the chief himself will make sure that justice is served. Thank you very much. And finally, blessing. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> so can you tell us about the project that you're working on? Yes. Um, the project we're working on is um, child marriage abandonment in Katsina State, Nigeria, using positive deviance approach. So we know that in every community, there are always positive deviants, those who will not follow the norm. Positive deviance is an innovative behavior change approach that highlights, discovers, and amplifies existing solutions in a community, which means in every community, no matter what everybody is doing, there's always that select few that will not go with the norm. In Katsina State, the prevalence of child marriage ranges from 68% to 76%, depending on which year. And that's a lot of girls at risk. So positive deviant approach will help us amplify those within the community who did not marry off their daughters before the age of 18 and use their strategies, use them as examples, focal points, use their strategies to encourage other people and because they live in the community, they also know the girls who are at risk of child marriage. So they can also serve as advocates to the parents, to the families whose girls are at risk and other gatekeepers. Um, I mean, that sounds wonderful. I suspect that viewers may not necessarily know all the impacts that child marriage can have on a girl and a woman for the rest of her life. Can you explain a little bit about the ramifications of getting married at a very young age. Okay, the effects of child marriage are more than we, more than people actually see. Most times, people just see sexual reproductive health and rights issues, but it starts a cycle of poverty. When many girls are married off early, they don't have agency over their body. 
they don't have autonomy, many don't even know how to read or write, they don't have any source of income, no education, so they are stuck in that circle. They have to rely on the man for everything. That's like the first thing. Then their health is also at risk. Their sexual reproductive health, they are exposed to fistula, they are exposed to even death, you know? Then they are exposed to different forms of violence, domestic violence. Now we know in the world today that even older women face domestic violence or different forms of violence, be it workplace, be it at school. Now imagine a younger girl who doesn't have agency, who doesn't have a voice of her own, who doesn't have earning power. Multiply the violence she's going to face by 10. That's what they are exposed to. And it opens a circle. We have seen with research that the likelihood of the child, of a child bride to become a child bride herself is one. The circle always repeats itself because most times they don't know any better. But this positive deviance approach is going to help us amplify those who have said, okay, our children did not get married before 18. Not all of them got a formal education, but they were still able to make something tangible out of their lives because they did not get married as children. Lovely, okay. I'm just going to ask each of you in turn what difference the money would make to your project. Do I start or do I... Um, we can come back to Choma. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. So for us at Circuit Point, this money will not just make a difference to us, it's going to make a difference to 10 communities in Imo State and Eboin State because we will be able to help not just the community members, but pregnant women and nursing mothers in particular. We're also going to be helping girls in, in um, secondary schools in particular, as well as brides-to-be. Because for us, the girls are the future mothers, so we want to actually educate them from an early age so we can create awareness, they get comprehensive uh, sexuality education, they can take informed decision, and they become change agents from that age. We also want to target pregnant women and nursing mothers because they, they are at most at risk of being influenced to perform infantile FGM as soon as they deliver their babies, female babies, or when for nursing mothers that have female babies. So we want them to understand first that the health problems they have been experiencing is associated with a practice performed on them when they were infants. So they can resolve not to perform FGM on their female babies, as well as brides to be, because they are going into marriage, they're going to be um, pregnant in, in the coming future, so they can understand the consequence of FGM. And for those that are survivors of infantile FGM, they can also know that there is a possibility of sexual pleasure after FGM. Um, one thing I didn't ask you earlier is why is FGM done in your community? I know sometimes it's a gateway to marriage. Is that the case or is it for other reasons? So that's, that's not the case in Southeast uh, Nigeria. So infantile FGM is prevalent because, first of all, a community believes it's a tradition that has been passed down from generation to generation. And they believe that if uncontrolled, the female libido will make their daughters promiscuous as young girls and unfaithful as wives. So it's a measure to control the sexuality of women. For, and for us, because it's performed at infancy, is an extreme form of violation, mm. human right violation. So it, it runs deeper because... In these communities, there's a culture of silence on sexual and reproductive health and rights. So women just don't talk about their sexual and reproductive health problems. And it makes it look okay that FGM is performed on someone and there is no issue. When in the back or behind or within the person, they know that they are undergoing a lot of problems. So because of this silence, it has led to persistence of the practice of FGM in these communities. Lovely. And presumably because it's done on babies, babies being... They don't remember. Yes. They don't have stories. You, you don't know what they're passing it. through. Yeah. Whereas when it's done on children or teenagers, then they're more likely to speak to up. To speak up, yes. Eventually. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Habiba, what difference would it make to you? Uh, thank you. 
We know women are the core of our society. If a woman is emotionally and psychologically prepared to be a productive member of the community, everybody else is taken care of. With this money, we are going actually to target the fistula survivors and support them to become productive members of the community. We are going to tap into their inner resources and build their capacity to be able to stand up for themselves. We are also going to use the resources to create forums where these women can be able to participate in all the services and their community, especially when it comes to policy changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there a lot of abandoned families as a result of fistula? I mean, it has a, a wider effect than just the poor woman who's affected. Presumably her children, if she's abandoned, she can't look after her children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually the effect of fistula to the community goes beyond the physical mm -hmm. that uh, most people talk about. Because uh, fistula affects the psychological, the social and the entire well-being of the everyone in the society. Because when your parent is affected with fistula, most likely the children in school will be ridiculed, they'll be stigmatized, and that affects our, their performance in school and even how they relate with the other people. Uh, most of the time when we look at the fistula, we look at the effect it's having on this woman. But, uh, and we also say that their husband abandoned them. But we never stop to look at what makes these men to run away. What is the psychological effect that the condition has on the husband? Because we'll find most of the time, they'll want to run into alcoholism and drug abuse just to, sh to protect themselves from the effect that they are going through. And the woman, whenever she's affected too, she's undergoing a lot of issues because she, she's struggling to put her family together, protect her children, be able to manage her marriage, and that one affects everybody in the society. Flavia. Uh, sorry, what, what, uh, what impact would it have if you won the 30,000? So 30,000 is quite a lot of money to do a lot of um, complementary support to dissemination of the national sexuality education framework. We do know that most of our governments, the third world governments, they don't have enough funding. They always have the policies and frameworks in place. But even when they develop implementation plans, they don't allocate resources. So for us, this money is going to help us to mobilize the religious leaders who own 60% of the schools to be able to appreciate the sexuality education framework, but also implement life skills education in those schools. But at the same time, the money will help us to mobilize and engage parliamentarians, Minister of Health and Minister of Education to sit and make budgetary allocations for sexual reproductive health uh, rights um, uh, programs. Because as we speak now, the plan is underway, it's about to be finished, but there is no money that we can see. Our government is saying they want to first invest in infrastructure. So it means they will not have much time to... I think we to have to wrap up oh, quite yeah. soon. So can okay. we just very Thank quickly you. ask Edith and Blessing? Right, for, uh, for us as African Ghana, the 30,000 euros will do a lot to scale up the already awesome, amazing work that gender activists in Ghana are doing, contrary to what my president said, um, and make sure that girls and women in Ghana have the kind of future that they deserve in safe spaces. For us, 30,000 will help us kickstart a journey using positive deviance to encourage child marriage abandonment in Katsina State, Nigeria, and much. help girls who are at thank risk. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching. I'm sure you'll agree that's five fantastic pictures, and we wish them all the best. Thank you.